Appreciate you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, there's a few adjustments we make as we uh, get set up for a PowerPoint. But uh, <clears throat> before we start, let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful, Father, for every prayer that's gone up this evening. And we, lo Lord, that there are those on the call that audibly have requested prayer, and there are those on the call that silently have prayer requests. And But we're thankful that all prayer requests are known by you, and you care for each one more than words could ever express. So, Father, we're thankful for that care ultimately shown for the lost at the place called Calvary. And we're thankful, Father, for the finished work of Christ. And we're thankful, Father, for the unity and bond we have one with another in this uh, assembly of believers on this call, even this very moment. We're thankful, Father, for the testimony up in Anthem. We pray that you'd bless and encourage them and strengthen them. We pray, Father, for our testimony here and down in Tucson and many other parts where your name is honored and raised above any other name that's ever touched earth. And so, Father, we just ask that you'd protect us as believers, guide us through your word, and, uh, Father, help us to leave this meeting this evening different uh, in a positive light than when we first came. So Father, we ask to soften the heart and heart. We ask to revive the uh, sleeping believer. We ask to Father, just give us strength and wisdom and Lord direct this message from the beginning to the end. In his name we pray, amen. Now I'm just going to read two uh, verses. This is a, a passionate subject of mine. Uh, there's a few of these subjects uh, in my life, but uh, the two verses that I wanna read with you are found in Isaiah and in Job. Uh, both verses, I would say to you, uh, are uh, extensive in that we could take them up for, for uh, a very long time, all right? And we, no, we're not going to exhaust this this evening, but I'm just setting a timer so I can know how long I'm speaking. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31, and it says these words, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And um, the other reading is in the book of Job and verse 1. And I'm not going to read everything, but if you were to look at this uh, chapter 38 of Job, you would notice 70 plus questions. I believe there's actually 77, uh, but there's questions that God asked Job. One of my favorite books, one of my favorite chapters in scripture, verse one of chapter 38 of Job. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. And sometimes in your life and in my life, as we go through the whirlwind, we wonder where the answers are from above. And here God is in the whirlwind. And it says he answers Job out of the whirlwind and says to Job in verse two, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge. Verse five, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who has laid the, the cornerstone thereof, and so on. And so he's asking Job these questions. So Job gets a glimpse for the first time in his life of the majesty of God. I read this quote on the screen as you think of the words, wait on the Lord, be still, and no closeness with him, soar like eagles. Billy Graham once said, our world today so desperately hungers for hope, yet uncounted people have almost given up. There is despair and hopelessness on every hand. Let us be faithful in proclaiming the hope that is in Jesus. He said that over 50 years ago, and that truth then was just as powerful and as truthful as it is today. Proverbs chapter 29, you know the verse that I've quoted uh, a few different times and uh, one of my favorites as well but it says these words where there is no vision the people perish in the new living translation if you were to read the words that we just enjoyed together in isaiah you would read it and it goes something like this but those who trust in the lord will find new strength they will soar high on wings like eagles they will run and not grow weary they will walk and not faint in the book of Psalm chapter 46 and verse 10, he's saying, be still and know that I am God. And we're going to talk about this just in a moment. If you think about the context of Psalm chapter 46, this is a time when there was war. 
And he is saying, God is saying, be still and know that I am God. He says, I'll be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. 46 times in scripture, the commands to be still, but there's one that overshadows it. And it's the stillness in Job, be still and take majesty in God. If you were to look at different times, uh, one was still in scripture. You'd see uh, the story of Joshua. Joshua commands, sun stand still upon Gibeon and the moon in the valley of Ajalon. Stand still. The children of Israel by the Red Sea, stand still. Ruth and Boaz, Naomi says, sit still, my daughter. There's a lot of truth and it's very hard to understand and to really soak in, especially for a personality like mine, to sit still. And yet there's a lot of uh, profound truths and encouragement we can take through it that God is always in control. The one that overshadows all the be stills in scripture is Job and the be still and take in majesty of God. This past year, um, and I've just been appreciating this lately, you think of the COVID upheaval, um, but we've been enjoying the closeness of God. I'm gonna allow just some vulnerability in it. I, I heard a, a dear brother say to me one time, I never refer to myself when I speak, but I thought I'd thinking about that after, and the greatest preachers you've ever met have referred to themselves when they speak. Uh, the person of Christ, first of all, the apostle Paul, Billy, I, I can do this all day. So I, I'm, I'm just going to allow for it today just to show some vulnerability. But a struggle that I have in my personal life is waiting. It's my personality. Um, and some of us maybe can relate to that. Uh, we can't wait at grocery stores. We're go, 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 go. I had someone recently tell me, Matt, um, you're nonstop. You have to rest. And this is what happens. And uh, we can't wait at coffee shops. We can't wait sometimes at the hiking trail for parking or there's some slow hikers or whatever the case is. And we've gone through this year and some of us can't wait. We can't wait, speaker included, for this coronavirus, for this, this sort of turmoil we've gone through to end. Sometimes we say, well, we can't wait for people to log into Zoom. But God says, in the midst of all our trials, God says, wait. The Hebrew word Isaiah used for wait is kava, which means to wait. It means to look for. So it's not just to wait idly and to wait and sort of sleep. It's to wait and to be on the lookout and to hope and to expect. And they that look for or they that hope for or they that expect the Lord shall renew their strength. And that's the truth that we see here. I like this verse, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves, but when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. This is Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. You'll see a picture on the screen of a human's vision and an eagle's vision, and uh, the verse, of course, where there's no vision that people perish, and I'm just thinking about collectively as a body of believers uh, about our vision, whether it's for elders within our local gathering, whether it's for community outreach, whether it's for gospel efforts, whether it's to reach the lost, whether it's to reach believers through teaching, whether it's just to uplift each other and see where we are in the next year, the next five years, if the Lord doesn't come. And really, what is our vision? Because if you look at the world today, the world would consider what we've just gone through in this last year, coronavirus and COVID and everything else, they would consider perhaps loss of employment as a result of this, uh, sickness, they, re, they consider relational divides to be some huge detriment to their plans. And yet through it all, God has given us in this moment, I don't know if you've considered it this way before, but he's given us a gift of stillness. We are nonstop. I can tell you of families that uh, haven't seen their children for so long just through, through, through corporate life, and then all of a sudden COVID hits and they're with them every single day. I just wonder if we've stopped to maybe consider this stillness as a gift. What do we do with this stillness gift? How can we use our time effectively? How can we be used during this moment of stillness, this gift to bring glory to him while we're quarantined? I have a successful friend, and I say that just monetarily successful. I find him, uh, if there's such thing as spiritually successful, if you can even use that terminology, but he's a man that I, I do respect. Um, and he actually called me one time and he said these words. I don't know if you've ever felt this way before, but he said, Matt, I'm tired of being successful at things that don't matter and failing at things that do. He was reflecting on his own busy schedule, a close friend of mine, and he 
barely sees his kids due to the workload that he has and the sort of money that he makes. But he's just saying, I'm tired of being successful at things that don't matter. And I'm failing. I'm failing at things that do matter. And I just wonder if I say those comments to you as we just reflect on waiting on the Lord and soaring like eagles, if you and I have ever felt that way before. So let's leave this moment together uh, in this teaching moment here, just uh, being successful at things that do matter and failing at things that don't matter. I enjoyed a good sermon just the other day. Uh, the sermon was on three H's, on the hands, the heart, and the head. And the preacher was speaking about believers sometimes falling into a rut and sometimes thriving only with head knowledge. And he's saying, let's not just thrive with head knowledge, but match that with our handwork and our heart passion to fulfill what we learn through the word. Can't have a head filled with the hands working, then we're puffed up. Can't have the hands working without knowing what the word says, then you're ineffective. Can't have a heart for God without knowing more of him and using our head and our hands to show the world his mighty person. The world is watching you and I during what they consider, and some of us consider it as well. I do consider it also a sort of global crisis here. I've said this quote before. I'll use it again just because we're speaking about our testimony here today. But Moody once said that the Bible the lost may read and the only Bible that the lost may read is your testimony and my testimony. And I ask the question, do I live the word? Do I live what the gospel has done in my life. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, as we reflect on the absolute power of God at the place called Calvary in the work of salvation, he says, translated out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And do we live this way? Translated out of the power of darkness. We're different. No longer dead, but we're alive. And we're alive in Christ. And our bellies are flowing with rivers of living water. And the world today that's dead needs to see us filled with life. Spurgeon once said concerning his testimony, you know, uh, those of you on the call know that I was going to go there with Spurgeon. I just enjoy reading his writings. But he once said concerning his testimony, I bear my testimony that there is no joy to be found in all this world like that of sweet communion with Christ. I would barter all else there is of heaven for that. Indeed, that is heaven. As for the harps of gold and the streets like clear glass and the songs of seraphs and the shouts of the redeemed, one could very well give up all these, counting them as a drop in the bucket, if we might forever live in fellowship and communion with Christ. And I'll just drop a little nugget right here. I know we have fellowship believers on the call. I know that. I love seeing your faces. I love seeing voices but I really miss seeing each other in person. I do. I'm encouraged to see you. I like what Brother Hammond mentioned just, I think, last Sunday or the Sunday before, that we're, we, we, we live through each other. We, we, get, we get energy through each other. Christians need each other. The truth of this waiting, waiting on the Lord, to actively wait on him, to fill our mind with truth about God's character, especially as it pertains to our situations, Find things in scripture. In Colossians, Paul says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. You see that in the book of Colossians chapter 3 uh, and verses 1 through 3 there. And the Bible is saying here in Isaiah chapter 40, we're going to touch that in just a moment as I sort of maybe speaking fast tonight, but I'm going through some material. But we are to wait on the Lord that renew their strength. We'll mount up with wings as eagles. And we're going to talk about these eagles. On the slide that's right in front of you, uh, there's a there's quotes. I'm just going to read back to you as I read the same quote, slide that you're reading today. But Charles Spurgeon once said these words, without Christ, there is no hope. And the world today needs hope. And you and I can be pictures, can be reflections of the person of Christ. Francis Chan said, true faith means holding nothing back. It means putting every hope in God's fidelity to his promises. John Piper said, only when our greatest love is God, a love that we cannot lose, even in death, can we face all things with peace. Grief was not to be eliminated, but seasoned and buoyed up with love and hope. John Piper. Rabbi Zacharias also said these words, outside of the cross of Jesus Christ, there is no hope in this world. That cross and resurrection at the core of the gospel is the only hope 
for humanity. Wherever you go, ask God for wisdom on how to get that gospel in, even in the toughest situations in life. And Jonathan Edwards, one of my favorite, if you read some of his sermons, the enjoyment of God is the only happiness with which our souls can be satisfied. And we seek to fill it, our souls with different things, but the enjoyment of God really allows us to soar like eagles. I have very interesting facts here about eagles. So let me just share some things with you because I think you're gonna find this rather fascinating. These are actually real pictures of eagles and what they catch, but the eagle, and I was just uh, going through this um, as we were looking at uh, rainforests across the world, they were looking at different birds and predators and prey and in my uh, ELA class in school. And we started talking about the eagle. And uh, this is maybe three weeks ago or four weeks ago, maybe a month now. And uh, it started to fascinate me the correlation, the, the relationship that you can take with an eagle and bring it into the spiritual life. I actually had to be careful as I was teaching this to my kids, but um, I did apply it practically to our lives with them. But the eagle is the only bird, the only bird to never look behind them in intimidation of another predator. The only bird. I don't know if you knew that or not, but it never looks behind. All birds look behind waiting to get attacked. The eagle is so confident in its power, it's so confident in its ability that it never looks behind. I found that was very powerful. It's known to glide effortlessly through a hurricane, and that's due to its wing structure and its power. It's how God made the eagle. It can fly through a hurricane without getting damaged by the winds. It has a mate for life. Very unique. It operates effectively, scientists have said, as a male and a female similar, similar to a husband and wife, fully committed. Once the eagle finds its mate, it's committed till death to that one other eagle. That's how we are in our marriages. That's how we should be with other believers. We should be committed to relationships, committed to loving one another. It's what Christ was committed to you and I. He was committed to us unconditionally. They have the power, and I like this one, to shed their feathers to be well balanced in the air. So in other words, if they lost a feather on their left wing, they could manage through their mind to lose a feather on their right wing so that they're balanced. And what struck me as I read that is in our life, do we know how to shed weight? As I reflected on my own personal spiritual condition, do I know how to shed weight so that I'm balanced? And wherever these challenges are, but just ask yourself the same question. They don't push their eaglets out to fly. That's actually a myth. Uh, some have said, well, eagles uh, learn how to fly by getting thrown out of the nest. That's not true. Um, as a matter of fact, they actually stop feeding their eaglets so that their eaglets, their baby eagles, decide to jump and fly and catch prey on their own. And what really struck me is that as I just reflected to myself, I just wonder, if the Lord's people wouldn't feed us with the word, would we feed ourselves? Did you catch that? So if I didn't go on YouTube and listen to preachers, if I didn't maybe look at different websites online with different sermons that I trust from reputable speakers, would I feed myself or am I constantly going to someone else to feed me? God wants us in the word to feed ourselves. Then we can soar as eagles. They can fly as high as 15,000 feet. I believe most Cessnas and small planes can't fly that high. They can, and they fly above the troubles of life, solely concerned with their purpose. They can spot two different prey or two different enemies two miles away, and they can watch those two enemies simultaneously, knowing every move, and then be focused on which one that they want to kill. As I self-reflected, our life, can we spot the enemy miles away? Do we know which Bible verse to throw his way? Flip that coin on the other side. Do we see food miles away? Do we have vision as a church? Do we see what we want to spend time devouring, spend time feasting on, spend time getting nourishment from, spend time on the portions of scripture, spend time in our works in our community, spend time as having a home for God, serving one another. Do we have a proactive vision of this? Or are we constantly, and I just self-reflect here again, are we constantly acting reactively versus proactively? Those who desire shepherd roles 
within God's assembly. When the eagle's nest, listen very carefully. When the eagle's nest, which can weigh up to 2,000 pounds, that's the size of a small car. When that get nest gets damaged in any way, it could be a broken twig, it could be damaged by wind, whatever it is. The eagle who normally follows a routine like a human being wakes up at sunrise for most human beings and then goes to bed at sunset. That's what an eagle does. They will work 24 seven. They will work days on end to see that nest restored. It's the priority of the eagle. It's home, it's family, nothing can touch it. How about when we see sheep that are hurt? Do we care enough to put aside our own rest, our own interest, and just shepherd and restore? Something that asserts all of us, whether you're titled an elder or you're not. There are shepherds in our circle, sometimes with the title and sometimes with not. It doesn't matter. We're to serve one another. The Bible mentions the eagle, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, over 30 times. And the imagery of this eagle is often used to portray God's power. And you and I, the day we were born again, are infilled with the Holy Spirit. And God, I will tell you, I speak from authority from the word of God, God can accomplish anything he chooses through you. And we can never forget that. So there's power in the Holy Spirit. How would one soar like an eagle. Why would they even want to? If you look at this picture, now they're soaring over the clouds. I'm petrified of heights. Why would I even want to do this? Why are eagles so often found flying around the mountains? I'll tell you that if you study this, it actually turns out that this is where they get the best air currents, these eagles. There's an upward shape of the ground. It produces a strong upward draft of air. And once an eagle catches one of these, it can ride up and over the mountain. And Isaiah here is saying, and just think about this for a second, that the very obstacle the eagle wants to get past produces the power to rise above it. And sometimes you and I, our difficulties can produce updraft for our thoughts to set our minds on things above. I, Isaiah, if you look at the story of Isaiah, he can only get past his predicament of being so critical of God's people. And Isaiah 1 through 5, search the scriptures and see what he's doing there. And then God allows King Uzziah to die in chapter 6. And then Isaiah gets a, get, gets a glimpse, gets a, a vision, as it were, of the king. I mean, the king as in the Lord seated, the God of heaven. And he learns what it is to soar. New Living Translation says this. If you search Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is saying it's all over. I'm doomed. You ever feel this way as a believer? For I'm a sinful man. I have filthy lips. And I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. And seraphim flies. And a cold touches lips. And the guilt is removed. And sin is forgiven. And the Lord asks the question, and I ask the question on the call today as they're believers, you are, you are bought with a price and there is a purpose, a guaranteed purpose in our lives for the Lord. Some believers, more than one purpose, but there's a guaranteed purpose the day you are converted, the day you came to trust Christ. And the Lord asks, whom should I send? Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? Notice Isaiah doesn't say Roshan. Notice Isaiah doesn't say Brother Lewis. Notice Isaiah doesn't say uh, Sister Sue. No, he says, here I am, Lord, send me. And Isaiah, for the first time in his life, starts to soar like an eagle. When we think about this gift of stillness that we've been given, we think of this slide here where God guides, he provides God's provisions for us. I'd just like to encourage you to set our mind on things above instead of even of our own problems. Pick out scriptures. Here are just some practical truths as we look at the word of God. Just pick out scriptures that pertain to our particular problem and just watch him work through it. You think of waiting to be healed of a physical. I'm thinking about Brother Welsher and going through so many physical pains and, and, and being in the hospital, different things. Waiting to be healed of a physical challenge, a mental challenge a spiritual sickness. Focus on the word that he's a healer. You see that in Mark chapter 6 and verse 36 says that Jesus healed generously and joyfully in Mark chapter 6 and verse 56. Jesus provides healing for all generations on the cross. 
Think about Isaiah 53. Think about John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world. Healing for all generations. Maybe there's someone waiting on physical or practical or spiritual provision. Maybe there's someone discouraged that's on the call today. Maybe there's a believer with headaches on the call, a heavy heart on the call. Think about 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. It says these words, God is able to bless you, not just a little bit, to bless you abundantly. Jesus teaches us to look at how God takes care of birds and flowers for evidence. Notice how he will take care of us in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25 through 34. Maybe there's someone waiting on direction. Maybe you're saying, Matt, if you only knew, I'm just waiting for this door to open in my life. Some specific situation. Can I just help you dwell on a fact that God has provided, or promised rather, to guide you and I? Listen to Psalm chapter 32 and verse 8. And the words say this, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. Isaiah 30 and verse 30, 21 says this word, these words, this is the way, God says, walk in it. So whatever our situation, let our concerns about it direct our attention upward to our heavenly father who cares for you and I so deeply. And the truth of being still, the truth of waiting on God, the truth of letting the unseen pressures lift us up to set our minds on things above. When you and I realize, I like what our brother was mentioning today about prayer. When you and I realize how powerless we really are. It's then we turn to him. It's then we turn to the almighty one. Remember Paul's words in Romans chapter eight, our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Who is our God? Now we we can't even scratch the surface on this, but I do wanna share something with you in Job and I'm gonna fly through this chapter and this reading very quickly in New English translation. So I want you to just let the word of God come alive alive on this call today, right? One of my favorite books, Job. Notice Job and his complaining. So these men come into his life. You see chapters 30 through 36. In chapter 30, Job speaks of his anguish. In chapter 31, if you're studying it, there's Job's final protest of innocence. Basically, he's saying this, God's given me a bad hand, okay? Chapter 32, Elihu responds to Job's friends. He's angry with Job because Job has refused to admit his sin. Chapter 33, Elihu I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, presents his case against Job. Chapter 34, Eluhu accuses Job of arrogance. We can be arrogant with God many times in our life. Chapter 35, Eluhu reminds Job of God's justice. Chapter 36 and 37, Eluhu reminds Job of God's power. Chapter 38 through 40, 40, the Lord challenges Job. Over 77 questions. Let me pour the word of God into our ears. Let's listen to God speak to Job. Listen to these words. I'm just going to read them right off scripture. God says this to Job as Job is complaining, as Job is asking questions, as Job is sort of questioning God. God says this, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. Where were you? Listen to what God asked when I laid the foundations of the earth. You wonder, why are you sharing all this with me? Because sometimes we wonder, even as believers, Where's God in all this? God says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Verse five, who determines its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? Verse six, what supports its foundations? And who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who kept the sea? These are powerful words. It should encourage you and I that this is the God that we serve. This is the God that sent Christ to a rugged cross. Who kept the sea? inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb. And as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness, for I locked it behind barred gates, limiting its shores. I said, this far and no farther will you come. Here your proud waves must stop. Have you ever commanded the morning to appear, God says, and caused the dawn to rise in the east? Have you made daylight spread to the the ends of the earth to bring an end to the night's wickedness? As the light approaches, the earth takes shape like clay, pressed beneath a seal. It is robed in brilliant colors. The light disturbs the wicked and stops the arm that is raised in violence. Have you explored the springs from which the seas come? Have you explored their depths? I love those questions. Powerful questions. You know what he continues? He doesn't stop. He says these words. Just listen. If you just have to just sit back and just listen. This is scripture. 
Just let it penetrate your heart. God says, do you know where the gates of death are located? Have you seen the gates of utter gloom? Do you realize the extent of the earth? Tell me about it if you know. Where does light come from? And where does darkness go? Can you take each to its home? Do you know how to get there? But of course you know all this. For you were born before it was all created. And you are so very experienced. Verse 22, have you visited the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of hail? Something that you and I don't relate to too much here in Arizona, but God's asking Job this. He says in verse 23, as he reflects on the snow and the storehouses of hail, he says, I have reserved them as weapons for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war. Verse 24, where is the path to the source of light? Where is the home of the east wind? Who created a channel for the torrents of rain? Who laid out the path for the lightning? Who makes the rain fall on barren land in a desert where no one lives? Who sends rain to satisfy the parched ground or make the tender grass spring up? These are searching questions. Man can't ask, answer these questions unless they point to God. Does the rain have a father, God asked? Who gives birth to the dew? Who is the mother of the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens? For the water turns to ice as hard as rock and the surface of the water freezes. Can you direct the movement of the stars, binding the cluster of the Pleiades or loosening the cords of Orion? Can you direct the constellations? These are searching through the seasons or guide the bear with her cubs across the heavens. Do you know the laws of the universe? Can you use them to regulate the earth? Can you shout to the clouds and make it rain? Can you make lightning appear and cause it to strike you as you direct? Who gives intuition to the heart and instinct to the mind? Who is wise enough to count all the clouds? Who can tilt the water jars of heaven? I love that verse. We complain of rain sometimes. God says, who tilts the water jars of heaven? When the parched ground is dry and the soil is hardened into clods, can you stock prey for a lioness and satisfy the young lions? appetites as they lie in their dens or crouch in the thicket who provides flood for the ravens when their young cry out to god and wonder about in hunger then the lord said to job verse 40 do you still want to argue with the almighty i wonder if you and i sometimes wonder as we look at the world around us we sort of have questions can i just encourage you god is always in control now, Job hadn't said anything in verse, uh, in chapter 40, in verse 2, when God says, do you still want to argue with the Almighty? Job never said anything, but God knows his heart. He said, you're God's critic, but do you have answers? And then Job responds to the Lord in verse 3. It says, then Job replied to the Lord. He says, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. I have said too much already. I have nothing more to say. You know, there's a good verse uh, in the Bible, and I, I just fail to quote where it's found right now, but it says these words, because he or God is in the heavens, and you and I are, our, are, are on earth, let your words be few. We should be careful when we speak to God. Yes, we can approach him, but we should be careful as well. The Lord challenges Job again. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwinds. He says, brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. Strong words. Will you discredit my justice and condemn me just to prove you are right? Are you as strong as God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? Can you imagine what was going through Job's mind, going through Job's heart? You talk about goosebumps here. You talk about having the fear of God here. God says, all right, put on your glory and splendor. Put on your honor and your majesty. Give vent to your anger. Let it overflow against the proud. Humiliate the proud with a glance. Walk on the wicked where they stand. Bury them in the dust. Imprison them in the world of dead. Then even I would praise you for your own strength would save you. How can we show the world around us that we're linked with him? How could Job show the world around him that he was linked with above? We show them peace. We show them peace in a world that is filled with chaos, a world that's filled with panic. God's always in control, and you and I hope with expectation. You know the words, as I, I'm just looking here to make sure, oh, time is running out, okay. Um, you know the words by Ryan Stevenson? There's a, I have it right here on the screen, Eye of the Storm. I'm just going to quote them to you, and I trust that 
uh, this comes out okay. But this is a screen, well, this is a picture from NASA on the eye of a storm on the earth, on the globe. The other picture is someone who's protected by the storm. These words by Ryan Stevenson, Eye of the Storm, he, uh, post losing his mom to bone cancer, think about what was going on through his life when he wrote this song. A miscarriage of his twins, the church that Ryan was part of at the time was starting to split, it was starting to divide. He gets released from those that were writing his music and dropped from his record company. There's friends calling him that their kids were suffering addictions and asking Ryan for help. An agent tells Ryan, okay, the Ryan Stevenson, the guy who wrote this song, Eye of the Storm, he said, write this last song for you, not for the radio, just what you want to say about your life. And Ryan wrote, Eye of the Storm. Can I quote you this song? I'm gonna quote you a hymn right after this as well. So those of you who like music like this, those of you who like hymns, you'll appreciate both. It says these words, in the eye of the storm, you, God, remain in control. And in the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor. When my sails are torn, your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. When the solid ground is falling out from underneath my feet. You ever feel that way? Where you're standing isn't settled and things seem to be falling all around you. When the solid ground is falling out from underneath my feet, between, between the black skies and my red eyes, I can barely see. When I realize I've been sold out by my friends and my family, I can feel the rain reminding me in the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor. When my sails are torn, your love surrounds me in the eye of storm. He says, when my hopes and dreams are far from me and I'm running out of faith, I see the future I picture slowly fade away. And when the tears of pain and heartache are falling down my face, I find my peace in Jesus' name. He continues with the same lyrics, in the eye of the storm, you remain in control, and so on. Maybe I'm speaking to someone here tonight. Listen to this next verse. I don't know your story. I've been on the other end of phone calls, though, when these tests have come in. It's usually very sad phone calls. But the other verse of this song he wrote says this, and he's speaking from experience. When the test comes in and the doctor says, I've only got a few months left. It's like a bitter pill I'm swallowing. I can barely take a breath. He says, and when addiction steals my baby girl and there's nothing I can do, my only hope is to trust you. I trust you, Lord, he says. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor. When my sails are torn, your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. He says, I know you're watching me when the storm is raging and my hope is gone. When my flesh is failing, you're still holding on. Think of these words. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. And even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. The storms of life that you face, the storms of life that I face, the storms of life we face individually, collectively, holistically, as a local body, as believers in the body, globally, there are storms that you will face. Never forget, never forget that he remains in control. I'm gonna finish with this hymn here. Now, Brother Danny, I think is on the call still, but he called out this hymn a few months ago, uh, and it's one of my favorite hymns, uh, partly for the tune, uh, honestly, and, uh, but the words are even more powerful, but I do enjoy this tune, and I do enjoy even more so the story behind this particular song. I'm going to quote this song in just a moment. This hymn was written by Edward Mote, 1834. He was a carpenter apprentice. He was reared in a godless home. But he became a, a Baptist preacher later on in life. And um, one day he's walking home from carpentry. And in his mind, he makes four stanzas in his head of a song he wants to sing. Now, this is the song 
my hope is built on nothing less. Okay, so as he's walking home, he makes this song in his mind. Imagine this visionary. The following Sunday, so a week later, a minister reaches out to him to ask him if he could come visit his dying wife. Sure enough, he visits, he reads scriptures with her. If you've ever been to a moment like that where someone's dying on a bed, I have been numerous times, very solemn time. He reads scriptures, he prays with her. The minister that had invited him is looking for a hymn to sing from his hymnal, but nothing fit in the situation that Edward was there with the minister and his wife who's dying. And then Edward said, can I just sing this hymn that I wrote a week before? Now listen to the words. Quite fitting, quite touching, quite moving. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. What does the chorus say? Some of you might even be singing, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. There's no other ground that supports you and I. So as we close here, let's be encouraged to be successful at things that matter. Being still, it's so difficult, but we need to be still. Waiting expectantly, waiting as we hope in him, soaring like eagles, being a light to a dark world as we rejoice in the freedoms found in Christ. Our prayer would be that we could end our journey in life with the words Edward finished life with. He ended life at 77 years old. And as he lay on his deathbed, the same person who wrote on Christ the solid rock I stand said these words and he was ushered into eternity. I think I'm going to heaven, yes. It wasn't that he thought he was going to heaven as in he was unsure of his salvation. He just sees his life literally ending. I think I'm going to heaven, yes. I am nearing port. The truths I have preached, I am now living upon, and they will do to die upon. Ah, he says, the precious blood, which takes away all our sins. It is this which makes peace with God. And he entered eternity. Believers, be still. Wait upon the Lord. And let's soar as eagles and watch him work in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful, Father, for direction. And we're thankful, Father, for your voice, sometimes quiet, sometimes very strong, that's said through your word. And Lord, we just ask that as the word of God went forth tonight, that um, if some of us have hardened hearts, they'd be softened. If some of us are tired, we'd be strengthened. If some of us are discouraged, we'd be encouraged. If some of us are maybe apathetic, I don't think that's the case, but if some of the, we'd um, have a new fire under, underneath us, we'd have a new desire, a new uh, appreciation, a new energy to really live for the Lord and to seek the lost, to seek believers as well, encourage each other, live for one another, serve one another as Christ served the church. And so, Father, we're just, uh, thank you, Father, for the time we spent together. We add our amens to all the prayers that have gone up before. And Lord, we just ask you to continue working in our lives. We confess our weakness. We confess our frailty. We confess, Father, that we can't do anything without you. And Lord, we need you desperately. So we're thankful, Father, for the friend that never fails. We're thankful for the friend that sticks closer to a brother. And we're thankful, Father, for those everlasting bonds, those uh, names engraved in the palms of his hands. We're thankful for the unity we have one with another through the precious blood of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.